eyesight, like people and everything, starts with trilobites and things like that. Mm -hmm. Trilobites were the first, one of the first to have good eyesight. Now, did eyesight, their eyesight wasn't as good as ours. Did it take a long, long time for eyesight to advance to get to what it is today? Well, um, the basic anatomical, I don't want to say plan or design, because we're in Texas. I'll instead, I'll instead say the basic anatomical uh, bow plan. <laughs> there's, there's this German word I was trying to get around using, the bow plan. The, 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 the overall structure of the eye was established uh, in our, our bony fish ancestors. And before that, our cartilaginous fish ancestors, before 360 million years ago when the first water to land transition occurred. So the structure, the morphology, has been there for a long time. Uh, and the general idea is that, or the, sort of the prevailing wisdom, is that in the evolution of the vertebrate eye, what happens is the first thing that, the first thing that really has to happen is when you move from being fully aquatic to being on the land most of the time with an eye like ours, you have to tweak the, you know, the position of the focusing apparatus and the curvature of the cornea and things like that so that you can see on land or in air instead of underwater. But once you've done that, uh, you have an eye that is, you know, with a few nips and tucks, should be able to do most of what our eyes do. Uh, and a lot of birds and uh, a lot of reptiles come close in terms of their visual abilities to humans. They're not they don't appear to be quite as uh, uh, under, under the gun as far as selection pressure goes for high acuity. But what probably happened in mammalian evolution is during the Mesozoic, the age of dinosaurs, when you know, most mammals were small, most mammals were nocturnal, and they were doing their best not to be dinosaur lunch. They were doing their best not to be eaten by the, the, the diurnal predators of the day. Uh, and during this, you know, it's a hundred million years of nocturnality from, for mammalian evolution. And that had a profound effect on mammalian sensory adaptations. Mammalian eyes really ended up not being very good after that hundred million year period. But this is when our excellent sense of smell as mammals, our excellent sense of hearing as mammals evolve. And what primates have been trying to do, I shouldn't say trying, because, of course, uh, with macroevolution, you're not trying to do anything. But if I can anthropomorphize, what primates are trying to do is primates are desperately trying to re-evolve those good eyes and that good eyesight that they lost uh, during the Mesozoic. So if you look at a lemur, a lemur is almost the, the perfect combination because a lemur uh, retains an excellent sense of smell, like most other mammals, an excellent sense of high frequency hearing, like most other mammals, and unlike most non-mammals. But lemurs have also got great vision, so they end up having the full package of sensory adaptations. Our sense of smell is uh, absolutely pathetic for <laughs> most other mammals. Uh, and if I can be judgmental about our sense of smell, but it's true. Uh, and uh, our, uh, our hearing is pretty good within the range of frequencies that's interesting to us. But as far as high frequency hearing goes, humans have got pretty, lou lo pretty lousy high frequency hearing compared to other mammals. You know, this is why dog whistles work. Dogs and cats can hear a range of higher frequencies that you and I can't hear. So it's really our sense of vision that is phenomenal compared to other vertebrates. And I think that's why the talk focuses in on two aspects of vision in humans, depth perception and acuity. Oh, and back to trilobites. You, you we brought up trilobites. Trilobites did indeed have good complex visual systems, but they had compound eyes, as you probably know. Uh, and the problem with a compound eye is that each photoreceptor has its own little focusing apparatus. So we have one focusing apparatus for a whole bunch of photoreceptors. Uh, and it's like that in other vertebrates, it's like that in squid and octopus and things like that. But uh, for species with compound eyes, you can only make those little focusing units so small before you end up with basically quantum effects messing up your focusing ability. And so it's been calculated that in order to have visual acuity comparable to a human, but with a compound eye, at the smallest size of focusing unit, they're called omatidia, those little individual units in a compound eye, um, at the smallest unit possible, the eye would still have to be the size of a basketball. Wow. So, yeah, so trilobites did have great vision, but this is, this is a, a good evolutionary story about 
you know, what you, what you inherit from your ancestors has a profound effect on what you can do with that anatomy. And the ancestors of uh, trilobites had compound eyes, and so there was effectively an upper limit on uh, their visual acuity, uh, because that was the bow plan of, of, of the eye that they inherited. Hmm. So. Now, how did you get interested in anthropology? So I uh, have, uh, my father is an artist, but he has a degree in anthropology from the University of Texas. So I grew up, yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I grew up hearing about uh, Australopithecines, and I grew up hearing about cultural anthropology and archaeology. And so when I came to the University of Texas as an undergrad, I knew that I was interested in anthropology, and I'd been exposed to it early on. Most of the freshmen in my intro class surprise me that they enroll for an intro to physical anthropology and they don't know what it is. <laughs> they, they find out once they're in the class. But I, I knew what it was and I felt really lucky because I was free to explore all of my different interests in anthropology and uh, eventually realized that, wow, what I was really interested in was functional morphology and evolution of, of, of primate structure. And by the time I got to grad school, uh, I realized that I was really interested in sensory systems. And I, I was also surprised to discover that there were lots of things about sensory systems that had not been studied. Basic things, comparative anatomy of the eye, you know, things, uh, uh, functional anatomy of the ear, things that you would think, you know, would have been uh, intense topics of interest for a hundred years, but for which there were very few comparative data published. And so, you know, I just, I started running with that and I haven't stopped since. And, and I also like that because I, I, you know, I'm really interested in primate evolution and all of the key events in primate evolution, from the origin of primates as a group ecologically distinct from other types of mammals, to the origin of that group that includes monkeys, apes, and humans, and tarsiers, they're all marked by really pretty profound transitions in sensory anatomy. And so for me, the story of primate evolution and, and early human evolution, since we're primates, is really partly, in large, I should say in large part, uh, a story about the evolution of sensory systems. And so once I realized that, you know, an interest in sensory functional anatomy came together with an interest in primate evolution, I felt like I found my niche. Huh.